I think there's certain perception, a misperception, that China's uh, growth, tremendous growth, was because of the lack of policy uh, regulations. It was because of the abuse of the privacy. Uh, I, I would bet that the, those people uh, didn't live in China. So they, they don't know what's going on. My name is Long Chen, and I'm director of the Lohan Academy, which is an uh, open think tank uh, endorsed by Alibaba Group. And I'm also the executive uh, provost for the Hupan School of Entrepreneurship. Digital technology is different from previous technological revolutions for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, it has very low threshold of entry. So if you look at globally, uh, more than 60% of the adults in the emerging markets, actually they have the mobile phones, and including in Africa, even among the poorest people. So it's very inclusive in, in this way. Uh, another special feature is that uh, it digitized information. And so information we know that it's, it's non-rival, which means it can be used unlimited times. Sometimes people say uh, uh, data is oil, but data is not oil. Data is more like, uh, like fire, you know. You can have the fire pass on to another person. Both of you could have fire. So, it, so that's a very different kind of production input. So if you combine those two factors, that is very uh, cheap for everybody to participate. And everybody can produce information at, at very low cost, and it can be shared unlimited times. So that together becomes a major driver in this age. Um, so the economy has been, is, so the, it is fundamentally changing the micro foundation of the macro. So when I say this, I mean that it is changing how consumers gather information, build their own trust systems, and making uh, consumption decisions. It's changing how the producers coordinate between them, among themselves, and changing the relation between the customers and the producers. It's changing the economy from a, a supply chain economy into a networked economy. Digital technology is different from previous technological revolution. Previous ones were more like the trickle down. So you think about the steam uh, engines, electricity, uh, after they were uh, created, it took like uh, at least half a century to reach the Africa or Asia. But this time, right from the beginning, the internet and the later technologies, mobile internet is all that. So uh, they they reach those regions within years, and it's, it's very quickly show up. So it's very, uh, so this time it's more, it's much more uh, button up, at least belly up, rather than trickle down. So if you look at we, uh, what we observe that, if you look at China, for example, uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, use the mobile payment, use the internet, and you can, think, you can see that the people who are most active using them are not the wealthiest people. So I think actually, uh, globally, um, in, uh, digital technology is, is giving the emerging markets tremendous opportunity. And I think there's another reason for this. So whenever you have a new technology, there would be a lot of resistance from the, both the supply side and demand side. On the demand side, because the users already have habits. So if the current service level is okay, like finance, for example. So the people will tolerate. And that's why in the United States, actually, it has most uh, uh, advanced financial system, but it has uh, may, maybe one of the most outdated uh, payment system. Well, writing still checks, you know, so which is kind of ridiculous. But why do that happen? Because people are used to this. Then on the supply side, the incumbents, you know, they're used to this. It's, it would be costly for them to change. So. It's, it's strange, but this is very interesting, is that the uh, supply side and demand side, they, they go hand in hand to resist the new technology. In that way, then emerging markets, they don't have much burden because the, the current service level is really bad. So they have a lot of desire to improve and there's much less resistance. So let me first mention a little bit what China has experienced in the past uh, two decades. Now, we, I think pretty much everybody knows that China has become the second largest economy in the world. So it's, it's ascending very fast. What was really underappreciated was that in the past 10 years or so, China has become the, one of the leading countries 
uh, have, that have the a mobile uh, lifestyle. So uh, back in 2009, China's uh, uh, online consumption was about 1% uh, of the retail sales in China, which was below average, actually, lower than a lot of the advanced countries. But then back in one year ago, China's uh, online consum cons consumption already accounts for about a quarter of the retail sales of China. So, uh, so that has become a macro phenomenon, from 1% to 25%. Think about this. So, the, so that so China not only has become the second largest economy in the world, it has become, it has digitized. It has the, like a billion um, uh, mobile internet users, and pretty much all of them using the mobile payment. Uh, in terms of, so that, just now I mentioned the commerce, the trade. How about pay mobile payment? Back in 2011, I remember, China's mobile payment is about 15 billion US dollars. US was about 8 billion, so like similar, very trivial. Then, then now China's mobile payment is like, it, it's trillions of US dollars, and which is hundreds of times of that United States. So uh, I am giving you this couple of examples to, to, see, to show that as a, China as a good example of the emerging markets, it could transform it, itself, become the dig, a country less, that has a mobile lifestyle. I think this is new growth paradigm for the emerging markets. They don't need to go through finished industrialization then get to the digitalization. Actually, they can do both of them at the same time. So that's the, something we see exciting uh, for the emerging markets. Uh, so, and they still have the low cost, uh, labor cost is all that relative to the uh, advanced countries. But now they have the technology actually transform how they coordinate. And so that exactly is the China experienced. China's economy is still rising fast. In the meantime, China has transformed itself as the leading country in e-commerce and, and the mobile payment. And also mobile payment then start becomes the basis for a new round of the, a lot of the new uh, innovations. For example, sharing economy. Think about sharing economy. The basis of sharing economy, you have to use the mobile payment. And in China, everybody uses the mobile payment. So now, the, 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 a lot of the uh, the sharing economy and also the uh, IoT stuff, you know, you have to use that payment. You don't so to 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 to, to grow. And so you can see that I think, uh, it, rather than think about the using the cheap labor, export oriented. Uh, the, that, uh, that was proven to be uh, successful for many Asian countries, but I think uh, in addition to that, that can be combined with the digital technology. And so we do remember that the industrial revolutions, several runs, including the, the, uh, uh, the, the electricity, right? And now it's the, it's the computer and the digital technology. And the, the fascinating thing is that those are the things, those are the, the drivers that are changing a human being's fate. But the exciting thing is that they are happening at exactly the same time in the emerging markets. So I would argue rather than they will have a lot of problem, I think they have tremendous opportunities. Any innovation in the beginning probably needs certain tolerance uh, from the policies, certain ro room to, to grow. I think, I think there's certain perception a misperception that China's uh, growth, tremendous growth, was because of the lack of policy uh, regulations. It was because of the abuse of the privacy. Uh, I, I would bet that the, those people uh, didn't live in China. So they, they don't know what's going on. But let me give you an example of the mobile payment. Um, I've never met a single person in my life who lost money because of the mobile payment. I surely have met, met some people who have some problem with the credit cards. So the fact is that the mobile payment is several scales safer than the credit cards, the traditional bank cards. Why so? Because if you think about this, so when somebody swipe a, a card, you have no idea who's swiping this. You don't know if it's a monkey or dog or yourself or somebody else. But, but here, uh, when you're using the mobile payment, 
we know precisely who owns the phone. Do you have enough money in your account? Uh, are you in the right normal circumstances using it? You have so many more dimensions of the, of the, uh, to uh, to make the the risk assessment, to risk management, and therefore, traditionally, I think the according to the central banks, China central banks, the statistics, statistics the average, uh, the fraud loss rate, which is the yardstick for the payment sector. The fraud loss rate was about two basis point, two out of ten thousand, uh, for the traditional bank cards in China, which is pretty good actually in the world. But for for example, for Alipay, the fraud loss rate was lower is lower than uh, one millionth. So I have to meet a million people to find somebody who's going to lost money. My point here is that we are seeing revolutions in the fintech space. And they are simply much better, and it it becomes because the you see the economy itself is being digitized, and that means it has so much more information. Uh, then that information enables a lot of people to have a a, a digital ident identification, and that leads to uh, financial services because that leads to, that has information that makes the financial service to be uh, uh, to be sustainable. And that's why uh, that's why this is uh, this is happening. I don't think it's just a, a, you need some. I think it's wise actually to actively embrace it for the regulators. So I think I would argue it's not about abuse of the uh, policy at all.